Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to I'm telling your story through data visualization. My name is Ksenia Bocharova. I'm uh, from Trasis International facilitating uh, this webinar, which is part of the training workshop and webinar program of the Publications Office of the European Union, linked to EU Data Viz conference, which will take place this year in Luxembourg in November. More details will follow uh, at the end of the uh, course. Um, we would like to inform you that uh, this session will be recorded and the slides as well as the recording and link to the survey will be shared with you uh, next days after the webinar. Now I would like to uh, give the word to our speaker. Um, good morning, good afternoon. My name is Martin Lambrex um, and I will be the trainer for this webinar about storytelling with data visualization. Um, I'm going to start with a little introduction to storytelling in general and um, after that I will be uh, showing you some journalistic techniques that you can use for telling your story um, and after that we will go to see a lot of examples of techniques that you can use uh, with data visualization uh, for telling your story. So we're going to see some storytelling patterns that might fit your data or your story. In the next part then we uh, will be looking at data storytelling formats um, or genres, um, and uh, we will also be showing examples of that. And in the last part, um, I'm going to give you some tips on um, how you can do storytelling with data visualization with the design of your um, visualizations. Um, so those are the, the components of this webinar. Um, so let me just dive in into this introduction to storytelling and I'm going to do this by telling you a story, of course. So um, as many stories start, um, once upon a time there was um, this guy here, his name is Jan Peumans, he uh, was the, um, the president of the Flemish parliament some years ago and at the beginning of the new parliamentary year he was interviewed by uh, some journalists and he said literally that there were members of parliament doing nothing um, in the parliament. So at that time I was working at the newspaper, I was working as a data journalist, so of course this triggered my curiosity and I went looking for the data to identify those lazy members of parliament. So what I did was I went to the website of the Flemish Parliament and I was lucky because on that website you have these nice profiles of every member of Parliament. And um, I also could find data about how many documents each member of, of Parliament had filed, um, how many proposals for new laws, for example. And I could also find uh, data about how many times all these people had said something in Parliament. Um, so I wrote a little computer script to uh, get all the data and then I made some sketches um, for, uh, from this data. And the, this is what I came up with. Um, so this is a scatter plot um, and each dot is a member of parliament and on the X axis um, we have the number of times that each member of parliament had said anything and the Y axis is the number of documents um, each member of parliament uh, had filed at that moment in time. Um, but I know that in order to convince my editors to publish this scatter plot uh, in the newspaper, that I needed some uh, extra elements on the chart to better tell this story. And um, what I came up with was this. Um, I added two lines representing the medians. Um, this means that um, half the dots are above the horizontal line and half the dots, half of the members of parliaments are uh, below. Um, and so uh, the same thing for the vertical line, half the dots are to the left of it and half the dots are to the right. So with these medians, I could profile uh, the members of parliaments. The, the ones on the top right over here, they are the, um, the busy bees. They uh, file a lot of documents. They also say a lot of things. Um, the ones um, uh, in the bottom right, they are the chatterers. They talk a lot, but they don't file a lot of documents. The ones over here on the top left are the, um, the silent forces. They don't talk a lot, but they file a lot of documents. And then finally, 
the lazy member of members of parliament or the uh, the passive uh, members of parliament are in the bottom left corner of the chart. Um, by adding these um, extra annotations, the, the, the medians to the chart, I could convince uh, my editors to uh, run the chart in the newspaper. Um, so this is how it um, was published. Um, so a full page, a nice uh, full page of uh, with the visualization and also with the, the profiles of the four quarters um, on the on the scatter plot, and then some extra information, um, some uh, some quotes by some of the politicians um, on the chart. Um, we also made an online version of this, um, and I will quickly show it to you. Um, so this is the, the same visualization as the one that appeared on paper, but now adapted to, um, to the screen, to online. And so you can identify each uh, member of parliament and um, get the, the numbers for each member of parliament. And but we also added this uh, zoom button here to zoom in to the passive members of parliament. And uh, the funny thing was that the president of the, uh, of the parliament um, he was uh, himself identified as one of these passive members of parliament, but I think his uh, activities as president were not uh, captured in the data that um, I collected. Um, so this was um, a little story that I told you, and um, it contains the main building blocks of, um, of um, what all stories share. Um, um, so what I did was I told you a story. I told you a story about once upon a time somewhere. So um, this was a couple of years ago in Flanders um, in the in the Flemish Parliament. Um, so this is the context. Um, this is the the setting of the stage of the story. Um, and then there was someone or something, and uh, the president of the of the Parliament. So this is the character of the story. Um, and he is situated in the context, and then um, something happened. So he said that there are members of parliament doing nothing, so there is a cause. Um, and the effect was that um, he was identified as one of the members of parliament um, being very passive uh, himself. But um, also the result was that um, in the newspaper there was um, a scatter plot um, where he, uh, every reader could see who were the active members of parliament and who were these uh, lazy members of parliament. So th those are the main building blocks of, um, of all stories. So you have the context that is setting the stage, you have the character, uh, something is happening to the character, and as a result, um, the character changes or something else happens, so this is the effect. Um, and these building blocks of stories um, make that um, if you use storytelling that you can connect to your audience. Um, so um, if you have a good story with, with these building blocks, then you will be able to engage with people um, by means of emotion. So with these stories, you can provoke emotions or you can also uh, provoke some curiosity in, in your listener or in your reader. So, um, people are engaged and are triggered to keep on paying attention to what you have to tell them. And, and once you get people to engage like that with your story, then you can let people learn new things um, better, then you can make people understand better what you want to say, and um, you will also be able um, to let people remember better what, what they heard or what they read. So. Um, with stories, you connect to people um, by engaging them uh, with emotions or curiosity, and this will lead to people um, having a better understanding of what you want to say. So this is um, the, the goal of storytelling, connecting to people so they better understand and remember um, what you are telling them. 
And if you look around, um, you can identify stories um, everywhere. Um, I think many people will think um, about uh, novels or movies, for example, when, when you uh, say the word stories. But you can also look at sports games to be stories, because there you also have characters and things happen to them and they have to react. Um, of course, religion, politics are full of stories. Um, you uh, also have brands making advertisements that are also little um, there. The goal is, of course, um, to uh, let you buy their products. Um, but those can also be looked upon as uh, stories. Um, there are many other examples. Um, you can look at the painting um, as a story as well. Many paintings have um, some kind of story to them. You see something happening to the people uh, pictured in the, in the, in the painting. So, um, yeah, stories are everywhere. Um, and one particular type of stories that I want to talk about with you are new stories. Um, and they have some special characteristics. They are a little bit different than, um, than, than stories like movies or novels. Um, but I think when we talk about storytelling with data, we can learn a lot from um, how journalists tell their stories. So in the next part, I want to uh, share some journalistic techniques with you um, that you can use to um, tell better stories. Um, so, um, first, a new story, in what sense is it different um, than, than other stories? Um, the difference with literary stories is that um, new stories try to inform rather than to entertain. Um, so, they um, are not mm, meant to provoke emotions, but they are uh, really trying to um, um, get the reader engaged by making them curious. Um, so the people um, want um, information, um, want to know what happens from news stories. Um, the main goal is not to entertain the reader or the listener, but uh, the goal is to inform. So that's a bit the difference between um, the, um, the two types of stories that uh, we are talking here. Um, so you have to um, make the reader curious but you also have to the, the you have to reward the reader so that the, their curiosity is satisfied and they um, will keep on engaging with uh, what you have to tell them one of the techniques that journalists use um, is what is called the five w's um, so um, this is taught in journalism schools uh, throughout the world a good news story should answer those five W questions, the where, the when, the who, the what, and the why, and then sometimes also um, the how. And if you look at this, this is actually quite similar to um, what we have seen um, as the building blocks of stories. So the where and the when is the context, the who, of course, is the character, and then uh, the what is the cause and effect. Um, so in this sense, new stories and, and other kinds of stories are um, kind of related. Um, but um, whenever you write an, an, an article or you write a publication, then I think it's important to um, keep these five W's um, also in mind that um, if, if you want to give complete information to the reader, then you need to provide answers to those five questions. Another journalistic technique, and this is not specifically related to data visualization, but uh, we'll come to that in a minute, is what is called the inverse pyramid. Um, and in the inverse pyramid, um, in this principle, um, you have to make sure that the news that you want to communicate about is in the top part of your article, in the first part of your article. Um, then you give uh, further down in the article, you give important details, and then in the last part, you can give uh, even more background information. Um, so the reason for um, the reason why this principle was invented was because um, in, in back in a uh, few years back when print was uh, really dominating news, um, journalists were assigned a fixed length article. So, for example, a journalist would have to write um, a thousand word article um, and then he, had, of course, had to decide um, what to put in that article and what to leave out and where to put what kind of information. 
And with the inverse pyramid, um, you, you, as a journalist, you are guided on how to structure your article. So you write the news first, and a good article answers the five W's already in the first part of the article. Um, and then uh, details come later, and uh, after that, the background. And then what might happen in, in, in newsrooms is that suddenly there is breaking news. And instead of 1,000 words, the journalist is only assigned a 600-word article. So he has to cut the article. Um, and with the pyramid, this is actually really easy to do. Um, journalists cut from the bottom in that case, which means they leave out the last part of the article, and the article will still stand, because you're only leaving out details and background information the news and the important details are still there. Um, this is also related to another saying in journalism, uh, and, and that is, when in doubt, leave things out. If you're not sure that um, something should be added to your article or publication, um, then you already know that if, if it's in there, it should be in the bottom part, and maybe you can even leave it out completely, because um, if you're doubting if it's important, that means that it's not that important. So well, um, this is the uh, inverse pyramid um, of journalism. Um, one example of um, an article, I just took a, a random article here to illustrate this. This is already um, for, from some time ago. And in the meantime, Boris Johnson has done um, other things. Um, this is an article about um, how he had a fight with his um, um, with his partner and um, because of that his, his campaign was compromised and i want to um, um, zoom in on the first paragraph here um, i'm just going to read it so boris johnson was struggling to keep his campaign to become prime minister on course on saturday night as he repeatedly refused to explain why police had been called to his home after a loud late night altercation with his partner um, if you look at this um, um, paragraph here, you can see that there is the when and where. You have Saturday night, you have the, uh, Boris Johnson's house, you have the main character, which is uh, Johnson himself, of course, and you also have a description of what happened and what was the, uh, the effect on, on his campaign um, in, this, uh, in this case. So this one paragraph is already answering the five w questions and only after that um, you um, get more details about what happened and what exactly was the effect on um, boris johnson's campaign um, so you can see that the five w's and the inverted pyramids um, in many news articles um, so um, if you pay attention to it you will recognize this pattern um, in uh, news stories uh, throughout um, maybe a little practical side note here. So in the slides, you have all the links to um, the examples that I'm going to show. Um, on each slide, I will only show the first link. Uh, so the, the other links are there um, for people consulting the slides afterwards. So um, I'll limit myself to the first example on each slide um, because our, our time is limited, of course. The third journalistic technique um, is to make it personal. Um, the easiest way to engage with readers and, and, and the audience is to answer the question they have. Um, and the question is, what's in it for me? Um, what kind of effect will this new story have on my life? Um, because, of course, uh, that's the easiest way to engage with people. For the people, um, for people, the most important person in the world is, of course, themselves. So if you manage to relate um, news stories or, or data to the day-to-day um, -day life of people, uh, of their own life, that is really powerful because then you are guaranteed to have um, an engagement from your audience. Um, so one technique journalists use is to put the you in the headline. And you can see some uh, examples here. So this is an example that we're going to look at in a minute. How much hotter is your hometown than when you were born? Um, see how your salary compares. Um, the best and worst places to grow up, how your area compares. 
Um, as, as a reader, you're triggered to click on that because um, you, you get curious about, yeah, uh, what is my situation? Um, how does my situation compare to others? So this is really um, powerful. So um, let me show you the first example there. This is by uh, the New York Times. Um, so this is an article that is asking some inputs from the reader. So as, as a reader, you have to first select um, your hometown. I'm just going um, to select Paris here. And then you have to enter your birth year. And I was born in 1980. Um, and then it should update. Let's see, going to reload the page. Let's go to Paris again. 1980. Okay, now we're there. So um, now the um, the article knows um, on what city to zoom in and also on what year. And so what is happening now is uh, there is some information about Paris and uh, the year that I was born. So it's the article says that. Uh, back then, you could expect two days uh, of the year to have a temperature of more than 32 degrees Celsius. Um, today, that has changed to three days, um, um, three days a year, and then you get a chart that is showing you um, that, um, yeah, in um, later periods, this might go up to seven uh, of these very hot days per year. Um, so it's an article about climate change, but it's personalizing the, the information that is given to the reader. And I think this is very powerful. Um, and even this um, um, article manages to connect to the reader in two ways. It's um, it, um, on, in one, on one side is zooming in on the geography or the location of, of the user, and also then it's connecting to the um, birth year of the reader. So, there are two ways of connecting to the reader, and um, um, it gives you very personalized information. So this is um, very relevant information for the reader. And so um, with this technique, um, you can get the, um, a lot of engagement from the reader. Um, further down, you can also see that the, the text of the article um, is also updated according to the um, information that was provided um, by the reader. And further down, you have a map that is also zooming in on the location. So, um, if you manage if you manage to put the U in the headline, and if you um, have some kind of mechanism to uh, zoom in um, on the the situation of the reader um, by having them filtering some data, for example, that is when um, things get really powerful and engaging for uh, readers. Then another um, te technique is um, what I call here to put in people. Um, whenever you are telling uh, a story with data and, and with visualizations, usually what people see is quite abstract. They see dots on a map, for example, or they see bars on the bar chart. This is not something that um, you can empathize with. And um, humans are empathic beings. So if you manage to put in real people, stories of real people, then you will also get a higher engagement from, uh, from the reader. Um, and as I say here, it's much easier to relate to a person than to a number, a dot, or an average. Um, so one example of that um, is um, this interactive piece by um, The Guardian. Um, they analyzed um, a data set about um, people that were arrested um, and then um, guarded in um, a prison in Chicago. Um, and so um, if you scroll down, you see this kind of visualizations to show you um, how many people were arrested. You can also see the breakdown by race. And you can also see where they were arrested. Uh, but as I said, this is all quite um, abstract and it's not very relatable for readers. Um, so what uh, the authors of this piece then did uh, uh, was um, highlighting the situation and the story of one of these people that were arrested and detained in this prison. Um, and they um, repeat this technique further down. Um, so we have more of these visualizations. 
But here you have the uh, story of Charles Jones, and you even um, get a picture um, of this person. So um, this is much more um, yeah, human information that is much more uh, relatable for readers than just these um, um, generic um, things or generic icons that you see here. So if you manage to put in or mix in stories of real people, um, this will also help um, engage uh, the reader. So um, if you can try not to limit it, uh, if you're telling a story with data to abstract visualizations, but um, make sure that uh, you can indicate that there are real people behind the dots. So uh, putting in people is also a way of engaging uh, the reader. Those were the uh, data, data storytelling techniques used, um, um, by, or, or journalistic techniques used in media uh, news stories. Um, what I, in the next part, I want to zoom in on some patterns, some, some general techniques that um, might fit your data and your story. Um, and for each of these patterns, um, I'm also going to show you an example, an illustration of um, how others have applied these uh, patterns in their um, data stories. The first story pattern is um, yeah, very straightforward. Um, it's about evolution over time. Um, and um, if you have um, Evolution over time, usually what uh, you will use to visualize as if that information are line charts. Um, and line charts can be, um, can be very engaging. If you have a line, a flat line that suddenly drops, then people get curious. So if you have a break in your time series, something unusual um, going on, um, then that is already um, worth visualizing to tell um, what has happened um, in, in, in the history uh, of this chart. Um, so one example of that, um, this is by The Economist, is this one. It's about um, the ice on Greenland melting. And uh, you can see that um, the red line is what the story is about, how the ice is melting in um, this year. And you can see that this deviates uh, very much from um, the situation in previous years, which is depicted in blue uh, over here. Um, and so um, by simply um, drawing the, the time series, um, you can, you're already telling the story and uh, things changing over time, um, it's, it's related to the cause and effect, um, the, the, those building blocks of storytelling. This is what um, people want to know. So, um, of course, if you see this chart, you want to know what is happening. There is definitely something going on. Um, there was something causing um, this effect that we're seeing on the chart. So this is um, immediately in engaging for uh, people. Um, the next technique um, or pattern is to zoom in. Um, so um, you can start a story with a big visualization, data visualization showing the overview of the, the, the whole data set or the, the whole situation that you have data on. Um, and then uh, you can start zooming in to the interesting details. Um, so we've already seen uh, this technique in action. Um, so um, it's exactly uh, this chart that is using that technique. So, um, on opening, you give the, the broad overview of um, what is in the data. Um, so we're looking again at the members of parliament. You have the four quadrants. Um, people already know what this is about um, with the text um, above there. And then um, you give a control or you trigger something so people can zoom into these um, passive MPs. Um, because of course, that's the, 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 the juicy bit in this story. So. Um, you give the overview first, and then you zoom into uh, what is important or what um, um, what is most of interest to the reader. Um, you can also have the reverse, um, and the reverse is that you zoom out, that you uh, start with a single data point, and then you zoom out to tell the whole story. So. Um, for that, of course, you have to select that data point uh, very carefully because it has to be representative of the, the whole story that you are telling um, with the visualization. Um, 
And as an example here, um, I wanted to highlight this piece by the Financial Times. It's um, a quite complex story about the, um, the, um, the housing crisis um, in, in the United States um, in, back in 2007-2008. And um, as you can see, the title of the piece is The Story of a House, How Private Equity Swooped in After the Subprime Crisis. Um, and you can see the house of the story um, in the opening of this article. So this is a story about this house that we're seeing, but it is also a story about um, yeah, the, the big economic crisis. So um, it's much broader than just this single house, um, but it's using the situation of this house and its owners to tell the story of the uh, economic crisis. Um, and in, these, uh, in this article, you have repeatedly this chart here, um, and this chart is showing um, some um, economical index, um, but uh, the annotations on the chart are about the house that we, that we saw in the introduction of the article. So um, um, if we go down, this chart is repeated, and now you can see that something happened again to that house, um, but the chart is showing data that um, is coming from the, the whole of the United States. So the article is um, zooming in on one particular data point, um, which is representative of the whole story, and then zooms out to tell the whole story. Um, so it's the reverse of the previous technique. So instead of zooming in, we are zooming out. <clears throat> um, the next pattern is uh, contrast, and um, this can also be a very powerful way of telling a story with data. Um, so with contrast, you juxtapose two or maybe more things um, against each other. Um, and I think uh, the next um, example will um, illustrate this very well. Um, so. This is um, a whole series of articles that The Guardian published on the gender pay gap. And they also have um, a range of articles um, that are uh, data stories. So they looked at a lot of data and with visualization, they, um, they are telling the story of, of the topic of uh, the gender pay gap. And as you can already see from this introduction here, those thumbnails, um, you have two colors basically um, repeated in all these thumbnails. Um, of course, you can see it from this thumbnail here, the orange represents men and the uh, blue represents women. And if we go into the article, you'll see that um, they have many different kinds of visualizations, but they are always um, focusing on this gap by juxtaposing uh, men against women. Um, so here you can see a chart, for example, um, every dot represents a, com a company and the orange dots are the companies where women are paid less. Um, and then the blue companies are the, um, the, com uh, the companies where women are paid more. And you can see the, the colors repeating here and you can also see um, yeah, on the left uh, in this chart, you can uh, you clearly see the juxtaposition of the, the left versus the right, the men versus the women, and they um, repeat this um, throughout all the visualizations that they are um, publishing in these stories. Um, so if you have a data set that is um, showing you um, the um, data for two different groups, for example, um, it can be more than two, but um, I think two is um, if you have uh, two categories that you can compare, this is um, something that um, is also a very powerful technique to use in data storytelling. So um, contrasting things against each other, um, using two very contrasting colors, using those colors throughout your data story, um, I think is also a very nice um, data, storing, data storytelling technique in visualization. The next pattern is intersections. Um, and you can look at it as um, um, where something overtakes something else. Something that was smaller becomes um, suddenly bigger than something else. Um, the, um, the number two on the ranking is now number one on the ranking. Um, so 
these are also obvious uh, data stories. Um, and one example, one very um, iconic example uh, of this, I think, um, is what happened on the, on the election night uh, in the United States in 2016. Um, so this is the, um, the page on which the New York Times published all the, their predictions and also the, the results of the election. Um, and on this page, you have this chart here. Um, and on this chart, you have two lines, one for the, the chance of Hillary Clinton winning the election, and the red line represents the chance of uh, Donald Trump winning the election. Um, and it's telling a very clear story. It's, um, it's, for me, it's an iconic chart. And of course, the, the, the focus is over here where, where these two lines intersect. So one thing, another, and um, you immediately you have a story um, that you can tell with data visualization. So those are um, intersections. If you have something like this in your data, make sure that you um, make a visualization of uh, what is happening there in the data. Another pattern are components. Um, and um, components um, um, are the building blocks of a whole. Um, so uh, with components, you can communicate how a whole is divided up in, in, into uh, smaller uh, units. And um, this also lends itself very well to visualization. Um, and one great example of this um, is this example by the South China Morning Post, a newspaper from Hong Kong. And they um, made this um, visualization. I think I um, should be able to make it bigger for you. It's a visualization of all the language spoken um, in the world. And so you have this um, big circle that is divided up into um, different parts. Um, so each part of the circle represents a language. And then within each language, you also see where that language is spoken. So those smaller uh, blocks here represent uh, countries where that language is spoken. And um, each um, Block, each building block of this visualization represents the number of pe people speaking a language in a, in a certain uh, country. Um, so um, there's not much text surrounding this visualization. It's all about um, how the, the languages are broken down um, over the world. Um, and so um, it's showing you the components of, um, of, of the big um, the big circle, which represents the, all the people in the world. Um, this visualization um, was uh, viewed more than 25 million uh, times on, on the website of the newspaper. And it, I think it's a candidate for the most popular uh, visualization ever made. So um, some of you might uh, even uh, have seen this before. So those are the components and the next pattern are outliers. And um, as, a, as a, a data journalist, there is nothing more interesting than outliers. The, the very high or very low values in your data, whenever you have outliers, you, you have a story, you have something to tell because the, um, the uh, records in the data that have these outliers, they have something special. There's something going on. There, there must be a reason for their very high or very low values. Um, so outliers are also uh, very um, suitable to be visualized in, uh, whenever you are telling uh, a story with data. Um, I have here an example of a chart showing you the strength of um, hurricanes in, in the United States. Um, so um, all these dots represent hurricanes and the ones on top are the ones with um, the highest wind speeds and those are the most powerful uh, storms. So this was published at the time Hurricane Irma was approaching or was um, uh, over the United States. This was a very powerful storm. So you, you can see on the chart that it is um, uh, actual outlier. It's a very powerful storm. Um, so. Um, yeah, outliers lend themselves also very well to be visualized. Uh, 
And the next pattern is um, repetition. And, and if you think about uh, fairy tales, which are um, also stories, obviously, if you think about um, fairy tales, <laughs> and three little pigs, uh, within stories, uh, there is of um, um, of certain parts in the story. So in the Three Little Pigs story, um, there's the wolf that is visiting the houses of the Three Little Pigs um, and then trying to, um, 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 or blowing away the houses. Um, so repetition is something that you um, can also uh, add to your data story to make it more engaging. Um, and uh, a very famous of that is um, a piece by um, Bloomberg, Bloomberg News. Um, they published this piece with the title, What's Really Warming the World? So they worked with people at NASA um, and um, people who make climate models to illustrate um, how, um, what is actually contributing to uh, global warming. And the way they do this is that um, they show you the observed rise in global temperature, and then they show you what the models say um, uh, about different causes that could uh, explain the rise in temperature. So they are asking, uh, maybe it's the sun's radiation, and, and you can see here um, that uh, only considering the sun's radiation, uh, we wouldn't see this rise in global temperature. The next one, um, maybe it is volcanic activity, um, but you can see that this also does not explain the rise in temperature. And maybe it's volcanic activity, solar um, effects, or the effect of the, the orbit of the Earth, um, but all three things combined still do not explain the um, observed rise in temperature. So um, they keep on going using this technique, the, the repetition of, well, maybe uh, it's deforestation, it's maybe ozone pollution, um, the pollution of the, uh, of the air. Um, but then in the end, finally, they say, no, it's, it's really greenhouse gases. It's the, the um, only um, explanation for the rise in temperatures that we see um, it's uh, the, uh, the greenhouse gases that we're adding to the atmosphere. So um, you see the repetition in the visualization. Um, they are asking themselves, is it this uh, or maybe it's that? And the answers are always no, um, except then, uh, in the end where they finally um, give the explanation for the observed rise in temperature. Um, so repetition uh, can also be a very uh, useful technique in data storytelling. Of course, you have to make sure that it doesn't get boring. It, it, it's, it has to uh, remain engaging for the, the reader. Um, it's, um, um, you need to make sure to give uh, the reader some, uh, some satisfaction um, for their uh, curiosity in time. Otherwise, um, they will stop engaging with your story. Um, another technique is to um, gradually reveal uh, the elements in your visualization. Um, so um, you could start simple um, and then add complexity and, and, and add new data step by step. And of course, this um, will lead to an engaging data story because the reader um, is giving extra bits in, of information on every step. And uh, of course, he or she is curious about um, what the final result will be. Um, and uh, I have here an example. It's about um, the trade war between um, the United States and, and, and China uh, and how uh, trade barriers um, are created for different products over time. And so um, it starts small. So um, here you can see what products um, were um, um, already tariffed uh, at the beginning. Um, so this, um, you can see it's a story through time. We're in January now. And, and if you scroll, um, you can see that um, in March, um, much more tariffs were added to, uh, to uh, much more trade barriers were created uh, for all these different uh, products that we are seeing here. 
so each dot is um, a type of product or um, or service that um, got um, a higher text um, when it was imported into the United States. Then, as a result, um, China also has started um, adding trade barriers uh, for different products. Um, then the European Union also did the same. Here, uh, Canada is following. So each in each step, a new information is added, and um, because it's a visual and added step by step, this leads to something that is quite engaging um, to read um, and and to look at. Um, so um, yeah, you can see how. Um, the trade barriers by the United States are provoking reactions by um, other uh, states. And so this is an example of um, gradually revealing um, more information and more data. Um, if you want to explain something that is um, complex, then this technique can also be helpful. Um, start simple and uh, build up the complexity in, in steps. Um, another technique that has become popular over the last few years uh, is that you um, let the uh, reader or viewer make a guess first before you reveal the data um, with the visualization. And um, an example of that was published by the Office for National Statistics in, in, from the UK. Um, and they had an article about some statistics and how these statistics um, evolved over the past 60 years. And then instead of showing the, um, the trends in the data directly to the reader, what they did was um, make some kind of visual quiz for the reader. So um, you can see it in this animation here. As a reader, you are supposed to draw how you think this statistic evolved over time. Um, so, the first uh, question here is, um, how low were house prices in 1957 um, in the United States? So, as a reader, what I have to do is I, I need to drag this dot to the other side and maybe house prices um, evolved like this. Um, and um, when you are done drawing, you um, click the button and it will show you the answer. Um, and you can see that I, I was quite wrong about uh, the evolution of the house prices in the UK. It, um, house prices were a lot lower 60 years ago. Um, so it, it makes the reader think first before they can really see the data. And um, of course, this is um, also very engaging um, because it, it triggers the curiosity and it also makes the, the reader um, question their own assumptions. So make a guess is another um, data story pattern that you can use. Um, then um, I think this is the last story pattern is breaking conventions or uh, to attract attention. Um, and an example of this um, was published by uh, Reuters. So they um, had this chart here about how high the percentage or uh, actually how low the percentage of CEOs um, in big companies were women. And um, at that time, the percentage was only 4%. And so they published this chart here um, showing the, the, the evolution of um, the percentage of uh, female CEOs in um, big companies. And as you can see, the, 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 the trend suggests that um, this percentage is, is, um, is getting up and it is actually getting up, but because it's only at 4% still, um, it's a bit of a misleading chart. So what they did was they um, republished uh, the chart like this. And now you can see that the Y axis goes all the way up to 100%. And what you get here is a very um, flat evolution. And you can see that in the end, the values are still very, um, very low. So um, this many would people many people would consider to be a bad chart because um, you can you can't almost see anything on the chart. Um, the values are very low. Um, but uh, by breaking the convention of that you have to show your data, you have to choose the axis so you can actually see what is going on. They um, created a chart that was actually much more powerful because now the message is well the line is going up, but the main message is that the values are still um, very small. 
Um, so um, sometimes you have to break the conventions of, of uh, making good visualizations to attract uh, the attention of the reader. Uh, okay, one um, more story pattern here, and I think this is also an, a nice example, is um, you um, can use icons, for example, to make things that are abstract more relatable to people. Um, and an example of this um, um, is this visualization. It's visualizing the income distribution in the United States with um, 100 houses. Um, so you can see um, the lowest income houses here. They are very um, simple houses. It's a small, uh, well, it's, it's, it's a big part of, of the, uh, the whole uh, of the 100 houses. And you have here houses that are a little more advanced and then uh, you go all the way up to the very big mansions. And uh, you can see that there are some swimming pools added here. Um, so this is an abstract data set about uh, percentiles of, of of income. Um, this is an, uh, a visualization of the distribution of income, um, but they make it very concrete by adding uh, these houses to the visualization. Um, so as a reader, you immediately get and you can more easily connect to what is uh, shown to you. And then on top of that, you have these little panelists here um, and, and um, other annotations that make it even more relatable um, and easier for people to know what they are looking at. Um, so uh, you can work with icons, um, you can um, try other um, techniques to make things that are quite abstract, more relatable and recognizable for readers. So those were the, uh, the patterns and techniques. Um, in this next part, I want to show you some examples of story genres, because uh, what we've seen were just um, yeah, more design te techniques. Um, you also have to um, have a sense of how you can fit your visualizations into your general story. And um, um, in the next part, I'll show you some of these uh, formats or genres. And the first one, uh, the first genre is the uh, magazine style um, publication of, of data stories. And this is, you can consider it to be the, the traditional way of um, uh, publishing data stories where you have text mixed with visualizations or you have a sequence of texts, um, then a visualization, then again text and then another visualization. Um, and I have here an example. And this is also by the Office for National Statistics. Um, so the title is Migration Since the Brexit Vote, What Has Changed in Six Charts? Um, so as a reader, you can um, already um, know what to expect. So you have some explanations and then you have a chart. You have a different explanation and then another chart that is highlighting another trend in the data. Um, and so the piece continues. So it's a, a sequence of text visualization, text visualization. Um, uh, you could also have this um, in print where you have a larger publication that is um, divided up into chapters and each chapter um, has its own um, visualization highlighting different things. Um, so um, I think it's, it's a more a traditional way of publishing data stories, but of course uh, there's a lot of value in, in this way of um, publishing um, data stories, but as we'll see, there are other um, genres that you could also um, consider. Um, the second one is what is called the annotated chart. So this is a visualization where you have some explanations added to it directly onto the chart. Um, and I think this is a very useful technique. Um, and um, I have uh, added a quote here by um, Amanda Cox from the New York Times. She says, that the annotation layer is the most important thing what we do, we being the journalists at, uh, at the New York Times. Otherwise, it's a case of here it is, you go figure it out. So she's saying that you have to add annotations to a visualization to uh, let the reader know where to look at and also what let the reader know um, what um, or add explanations to the visualization so the reader knows what is going on. Um, one example of this, um, and it's, um, uh, is this one. 
Um, let me try to make it a little bit um, bigger. Um, okay, so um, this is a chart about um, someone who went to a conference um, and was attending um, the, the, some speeches there at the conference. And he had um, a device that could measure the concentration of CO2 in the air in, in the conference room. Um, so what you see here is the concentration of CO2 during the conference. Um, and um, I think this chart um, doesn't need much more text around uh, it. it. It stands on itself because the annotations are um, explaining what is going on. So, um, you have the subtitle here, CO2 levels in an occupied conference room um, on a certain day. Um, at the bottom, um, you have the, the timeline, so session begins here, and then you see the uh, concentration going up, and then here the windows are opened, and that explains why there is a drop in the CO2 concentration. Then um, session resumes, windows remain open, but then you can still see that uh, the concentration of CO2 is going up, but not as, as high as it was before uh, the break uh, in the conference. Um, he also added some annotations to the y-axis. Um, so this is the re recommended indoor limit, and you can see that um, the concentration of CO2 was well above this recommended limit. And here you have the typical outdoor level limit um, so, um, yeah, during the whole time, the level of CO2 was above this um, outdoor level. Um, so, this is um, one single visualization with um, some annotations added to it. And as a reader, you um, can already get what the story is and, and, and what happened there at the conference. Um, if you want to know more details, you can uh, write the surrounding text if there was any. Uh, but the visualization stands on its own and is telling the story of itself. Um, so this is the annotated chart. Um, then another story genre or a format is um, a partition poster or um, a, 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 a big poster divided into different parts where each part can show a visualization or can contain text or can uh, contain an illustration. Um, I think this is a format that is uh, most fit for print, and um, it is sometimes also known as an infographic. Um, so, an example of this um, is this one over here. This is um, from um, a Spanish newspaper published at the time when there was the fire at the Notre Dame in Paris. And Paris, so you can um, clearly see that this is a, a big spread in the newspaper and that um, this spread is divided into different blocks and each block is showing uh, a different part of um, what happened and um, how the construction of, the, the, uh, of this um, cathedral was affected by the fire. Um, so this is um, something that many people would call an infographic and um, of course you can also use this um, for data visualization. Um, you can um, replace these illustrations, illustrations here by charts, for example. Um, this is a format that also lends itself very well for uh, telling a story in data. Um, but it's much harder to do this online. Um, this is something, a format that is um, much more fit uh, for print publications. Then there are some other formats um, that I just want to mention. Um, we uh, don't have the time to see examples of these, but um, other formats include flowcharts. Those are more schematic representations of processes, um, but there can also be uh, some data visualization um, in there. Um, then you have a slideshow where you guide the reader through a data set by showing them uh, a, a sequence of visualizations, uh, one after the other. Um, this can be static, but it could also be um, interactive. Um, then there is also something, something that is called data comic, um, where you mix technique, uh, techniques from comics uh, with data. 
Um, you can find some interesting examples uh, of this um, as well if you Google for, for data comics. And then finally, you have um, video and animation, um, which you can also consider if you are developing um, uh, a data uh, story. But of course, those are not easy to make. Um, this is, applies to data comics as well. You have to have um, some people who know about the techniques of, of comics or um, making videos and animations. Um, but those are other formats that you could consider if you are um, thinking about making stories from uh, data sets. Um, okay, in this last part, before um, we'll have the, the Q&A session, uh, is about um, how you can make a chart tell a story by um, um, thinking about the design of charts. Um, and one tool I would like to mention here is the visual vocabulary. It's made by the people at the Financial Times, and it is a tool that can help you select the most uh, chart type for your story. Um, you can find it at um, ft.com slash vocabulary. It's, um, they released it, um, so you can just download and print it. Um, and it's a nice tool because it um, makes you think about what you want to show in, in, in your data. So um, they have grouped these different chart types into um, different categories. So you have charts that show you deviation. Uh, you have uh, charts that show correlation. You have charts that show ranking. Uh, so different uh, aspects of your data that you could highlight with these different charts. So um, it's a nice tool because it makes you think about what in the data that you want to communicate um, to your readers. So choosing the appropriate chart type is uh, obviously a very uh, important decision and this um, visual vocabulary can help you select uh, the, the most appropriate chart type for your story. Um, another important aspect when we are talking about um, storytelling with chart design is highlighting. Um, and I think um, this is really important because whenever people are looking at the chart um, and there is no highlighting, they don't know what to look at first and they don't know what is important in the chart. Um, so as a chart author, you should guide the attention of your reader to um, indicate what is more important than, than, than other things in the chart. And you can um, use different techniques for that. So you can play with color by making the most important things on the chart uh, stand out. Um, you can use um, size and bolding of, of text, for example, to indicate what is the most important um, message in the chart. You can draw boxes um, or you can highlight things by drawing a circle around them. Um, you can use pointers like um, arrows um, that um, uh, are very strong indicators of um, um, or, or guidance um, um, elements for readers to know what is important in the chart. And if you have uh, interactive charts, you can also use motion. You can use blinking, for example, to show um, what is important on the chart. Um, as an example, I have here a chart about um, Arctic ice re reaching a low winter maximum. Um, this is uh, a piece uh, again from the New York Times. And um, within that piece, you have this chart and um, it is full of, um, of highlighting elements. Um, so it shows you the, um, the area covered by ice throughout uh, the, the seasons in different years. So each line is a year. And they highlighted here the year uh, 2015, which um, I think that was the year that this chart was published in. Um, so you have a thick black line uh, representing uh, the current year. Then you have the, the, the green lines. Um, these are the years 2010 to 2014. And so you can see that they are repeating the color of these lines in the text as well. Um, they are adding um, some um, bolding to this text as well. Um, here at the bottom, you have the, the season. So you have winter and summer, and they are also highlighted by um, adding some background color um, to um, these um, seasons. So summer is um, obviously yellow, winter is um, light blue. 
Um, so many elements were added to this chart to make it more readable and accessible um, for readers. And um, I think they, they did an excellent job here by playing with color, playing with bolding. Um, you also have this indicator here, this line that is helping the reader uh, understand what is going on. The same thing is um, happening here. Um, so as a reader, uh, there is no doubt um, about what is important and what uh, he or she should take away uh, from this chart. Um, we've talked about annotating charts before, um, and um, this can mean adding um, data labels to a chart um, to um, have readers uh, have access to the underlying data a little bit. You can add explanations, but you can also add visual annotations like um, putting a mark on the chart for the average or highlighting the lowest and the highest values. Um, or if you um, have uh, a chart that is showing progress towards a target, make sure you also mark the target on your chart. Um, so adding text annotations, but also visual annotations can help uh, the reader understand um, the chart. Um, one example here, and this is published by um, Pew Research. Um, it's an example of a chart um, that um, contains some text explanations. Um, let me try to make it bit bigger here. So uh, on this chart, um, you have um, uh, the average answers that people gave when, it, uh, when they were asked if um, personality uh, is more valuable than looks in, in, in people. And so you have answers for men um, and you have answers for women, and you can see that there is a gap. And um, for two countries here, um, the authors of the chart added this explanation here that says, the biggest differences in opinion between the nation's men and women were in Egypt and Saudi Arabia. So, um, and they are uh, connecting this explanation to the gap here, and they are highlighting the gap with these arrows here. And then there's another explanation here. Vietnamese men were the only group who were more likely to value a partner's looks uh, more than their personality. Um, so the authors of the chart choose some interesting bits on the chart and then decided to add, make them explicit by adding some explanation uh, to the chart. I hope um, this worked for many of you. Um, so uh, this is um, an illustration of what is called um, visual hierarchy. Um, if you have big fonts, then that is usually what people uh, will read first. Um, and so um, whenever you design a chart, make sure that um, the title is, is bigger than the subtitle, for example, and that supporting things like access labels or smaller, or uh, have um, uh, an, an, um, or have a gray color, for example, so they reside a little bit to the background. Um, so make the data stand out, and also make sure that the main messages stand out. And you can do that by playing with uh, font sizes to have this hierarchy um, of fonts in your data. Also know that. Um, just like pages, um, charts are read from top left to bottom right. Um, so um, make sure that the main message of the chart is um, uh, is a title on the in the top left, and and um, things like uh, sources um, of, of data sources they can um, best be put to the bottom right of the chart so that. Um, yeah, that is just the, the way people read charts, and, and um, you have to be conscious about this whenever you are designing uh, visualization. Titles are usually the first thing that people look at, so make sure that the title is already telling um, the story of the chart. Make sure that the takeaway message is in the title of uh, the chart itself, so that people are not left on their own to uh, know um, or to identify the, the message, what they should, should see in the chart. Um, and also make sure that the title is not uh, contradicting um, the message of, of, of the visualization itself. So it should be one unit communicating the same message, the title and, and the data visualization. 
Um, you can add data labels to charts, um, like um, putting the key numbers in there, like the, highlighting the most recent value by explicitly mentioning or putting the, the, the values in the, in the chart. But don't label every data point because this can get um, overwhelming. Um, and you can also stress the most important data points um, by um, highlighting them, by, by putting a circle around them or highlighting them with a circle on, on the line chart, for example. Then finally, to illustrate the importance of text on charts for uh, telling the story with uh, data visualization. Um, so this is a chart that is lacking a title and it's also uh, lacking the unit. So, um, this chart is meaningless. Um, as a reader, you don't know what is going on and you don't know um, what you should take away from this chart. So um, if I add this uh, title here to the chart, so this is a chart about um, people signing up um, for a petition to remain in the EU, in, in the United Kingdom. Um, so uh, as a reader, you know what it is about this chart. So. Uh, Char chart titles are actually very important elements of a visualization and um, I would advise to um, add chart titles and make them, um, yeah, make them communicate the message of the chart. Um, so here I'm adding one data label um, at the end. So um, I'm highlighting the, the current value um, by putting a mark there, but also um, putting the actual data value there. Uh, so this is actually the most important data point on the chart. And then um, I'm uh, adding less important details on the bottom. So these are some credits. These are also the, 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 the source of the data. And they um, have a small font size. So in the visual hierarchy, they are, are um, well below the, the, the importance of the, what the title has, for example. And then finally, I'm highlighting a region here and adding an explanation of what is going on there. Um, so this is an example of how you can tell a story by adding um, these um, annotations that explain what is going on um, in the data. So that was um, all about um, storytelling with data visualizations uh, in this webinar. Um, I would like to quickly mention the uh, remaining webinar we have in the training program. So on the 10th of October, we will have a webinar on non-standard data visualization. So um, I'll be showing you a lot of um, visualizations that go beyond just bar charts and line charts. Um, so I uh, also... <laughs> end this webinar um, and then as was mentioned in the beginning of this webinar we also um, have the conference on um, visualization focused on the public sector uh, later this year in, on the 12th of November in Luxembourg um, it has a very um, interesting lineup of speakers and there are also workshops um, so um, if you have any interest in data visualization within the context of the public sector, I think um, you will definitely take a lot of interesting things away from uh, this conference. So with that, um, yeah, I would like to conclude um, with some more resources. So they, those links will also um, be uh, in, the, in the slides that will be shared. Um, so there are some... Um, uh, interesting books. Um, I also um, have some interesting tools like the visual vocabulary is listed here. Um, so if you want to know more about storytelling with data, you can check out these resources later. Um, so we are uh, closing the webinar now. Before Q&A session, we would like to thank everyone for your participation. We will be sharing the slides as well as recording and the link to the survey. We will be happy to receive your opinion and feedback about this webinar, uh, submitting the survey.